Hi there everyone, uh, this is a post-session recording uh, for seminars that we recently ran uh, at Fox Hills in Berkshire um, and at True Potentials offices in London. This seminar will focus on uh, an introduction to inheritance tax, so it won't be the most uh, heavy inheritance tax session we've recorded in one of these sessions. Um, but yes, please do also um, check out lots of our other videos that we have made available on our YouTube channel. But as we say, today's session will focus on an introduction to inheritance tax. So what we're gonna cover? Uh, we're just going to have a quick refresh of current legislation. There have been changes in the last few years, so it would be good to uh, bring clients and viewers uh, up to date uh, with exactly where we are legislation-wise. Um, we'll talk more broadly around our views on inheritance tax and, and where we see um, important changes and, and strategies. We'll then touch on some solutions and options. Both those are very early stage options and perhaps things you know anyone could be doing irrelevant of stage of life as well as moving on to a couple of uh, later life strategies and, and, and the more complex part um, of inheritance tax planning uh, that often involves giving, giving assets away. Uh, then finally, we will touch briefly on wills and trusts, which we ourselves see uh, as a different space. We, we see that more as bloodline planning than the lifetime planning where we traditionally carry out our inheritance tax strategies, but we'll just touch briefly on how we feel the areas are, are interlinked. So, if we just start off um, looking at current legislation. So, currently, uh, every individual has a nil rate band of 325,000. So, this, this has been very static and stayed the same um, for many, many years. Um, in addition, the most recent changes, uh, and for many of these have been slightly misleading changes in that there was lots of press in the papers around uh, a new inheritance tax band of, of half a million. This wasn't actually true. What has been introduced is what's known as the residence nil rate band. So this residence nil rate band started off at 125,000 um, when it was first bought in in 1617. And since then, it's increased at 25,000 per year uh, and will do until the 2020-2021 tax year when there will be a full 175,000 of residence nil rate band available. Um, and as we say, adding the 325 to the um, 175 gives us that half a million. So actually it wasn't something that immediately was available, but as I say, from the next tax year uh, in 2020, 2021, um, individuals, uh, irrelevant of whether they're married or non-married, again, it's a bit of a misdemeanor that you have to be married to claim the residence nil rate band, um, but everyone has a, a residence nil rate band available to them. So uh, yes, as of next year, the full half a million will be available to people. Um, so why, why are we talking about inheritance tax? Why, why is it such a, a sensitive topic for many? Um, and, and why you know, do we have a lot of demand in our day-to-day -day work um, around planning for it? I think the bottom diagram there really illustrates that. If you look at the government's revenues that have come in um, over the, over the, the, the last period, um, mainly you know, due to you know, rising in house prices, um, and the fact that, the, that you know, little has been done to inflation-proof um, the inheritance tax allowance is available to people. So as you'll see in the slide there, over four billion of revenue um, was pulled in at the last count um, last year. And you know, we, we see cases every day where people come to us too late or perhaps we've discussed um, planning um, for, a, for a couple and said, I think we should talk to your parents. Um, you know, we, we had a case the other day where um, actions could have been taken, but um, you know, a divorced individual died state over 1.5 uh, million pounds, um, and there's going to be a you know 400,000 pound upward inheritance tax bill for that individual. Something that you know again can be planned for. We always stress inheritance tax is a voluntary tax. It just needs the right measures and intergenerational decisions to be made early enough in the journey. So yeah, we've touched on lots of the stuff that, that falls into these different nil rate bands. Um, but you know, under current legislation, there are both gifting allowances um, um, as well as the ability um, to give uh, assets away during lifetime. And you know, really, that does still form the, the core part of um, why the government have uh, exemptions for inheritance tax and why planning is possible. 
So these are usually split into two different um, gifting styles. The first is what's known as a potentially exempt transfer, or PET. So this uh, doesn't have any limits at all, and this is the physical gifting of an individual from one person to another. It doesn't have to be family, it can be a gift to any person. The, uh, the reason for doing that gift is if the individual survives for seven years, it will be completely outside of the individual's estate uh, and no inheritance tax will be due. Uh, if there is a death within those seven years, the value of that gift will get added back into the individual's estate and quite crucially use up the individual's nil rate band ahead of any other remaining assets in the estate. The other type of gift is one where we make a gift to a trust. Uh, trusts add significantly more uh, protection than the potentially exempt transfers for beneficiaries, potential um, divorces, future deaths, preventing and generational inheritance tax planning. So lots of our planning really focuses around first what can we get into a trust based environment. This very often you know, confuses people and people think you have to have money locked away in trusts. Not true at all. You can put money into a trust, loan it out to a beneficiary the next day. It's just we've put a much more safe, protective environment in place. This is known as a chargeable lifetime transfer. And there's limits of up to 325,000 of chargeable lifetime transfers any seven, any seven years of an individual. Um, and that is seven years from the gift. So if someone made a £100,000 gift, um, and two years later made another 100,000, there would be different rolling seven year cycles on, on those two gifts. So that's quite key to understand the differences between the two. But you know, we very much advise clients to use uh, the chargeable lifetime transfers over the potentially exempt transfers. One thing that sort of crops up quite a lot in um, today's modern society, um, with certainly far more marriages being of a cross domicile um, nature, is, you know, again, ex an exact refresher um, on the current situation as to whether someone is deemed domiciled in the UK. Um, interestingly, if someone is resident in the UK, even if they aren't UK domiciled, their UK property assets will get taxed under UK inheritance tax rules, potentially with no nil rate band if they choose to have their domicile elsewhere. So if you're someone that you know you or yourself are, are, are potentially not a UK domicile, your planning is more complex, um, but certainly not something that should be uh, avoided. There's definitely options available for people. So the general rule on whether you are deemed UK domicile usually goes back to your origin of birth, so, you know, if you were born in the UK and have remained here, 100% UK domiciled. Where there can be crossover and confusion is someone that perhaps was born in another territory, uh, but has since resided for a long period in the UK. So the rules now are as if you have been a resident in 15 of the last 20 years, you will be deemed UK domicile. So for many people born uh, overseas, um, that's, uh, that, that's a very important point uh, to straighten up and, and, and get clear um, to help us assist you with your planning. So when do you think you should begin thinking about your inheritance tax planning? My answer to this is that there isn't, uh, you know, there, there isn't a stage when you should or shouldn't be thinking about it. Uh, the earlier, you know, obviously every case is different, size of estates are very different, liquidity needs are different, but you know, we really think sort of clients should start thinking about their inheritance tax in their early 40s, because there's lots of small things that can be done, um, either which will be cheaper because they're a certain age, or just because they're a much more strategic long-term approach to inheritance tax. So inheritance tax certainly doesn't have to wait to that sort of late 70s or 80s when you finally think it's time to, to make a decision on this space. And often, you know, a sudden death means that planning uh, is, is non-redundant. So, you know, we really think you should think about it from as early as possible. As I say, that seven year clock um, means that planning must be done in a certain period of time in many cases to allow for inheritance tax planning to be effective. Sometimes overlooked uh, is the ability to combine pensions with inheritance tax planning um, and just a quick update on uh, how pensions sit from an inheritance tax perspective. So if you're someone that actually has more of your wealth in a defined contribution plan or perhaps a defined benefit plan uh, that pays you income uh, and more prevalently the defined contribution plan, actually all of these assets are outside of your estate for inheritance tax. 
Um, that doesn't mean they should be ignored from a death benefit perspective. You know, the larger that size, the, the more they as well need, need to be addressed. How best is it to pass on that wealth to future generations? Too few people um, don't put nomination forms in place, don't consider trusts, and on their death, uh, money is paid out to beneficiaries. If a death is before 75 tax free, it's great, but you've basically just um, created a problem where you could have met, perhaps retained that asset as a beneficiary in a completely tax free environment. And instead, you've rushed, you've had it paid out, um, and the whole, whole earnings on the income becomes taxable. So getting the death benefits on pensions uh, is just as an important consideration. Think of a pension having its own will or needing its own will to the rest of your normal, normal estate. That's usually the way that I sort of stress, in, uh, stress the importance of pension planning um, for clients. But yes, also any money that can be put into pensions in later life uh, essentially is a bit of a loophole because it immediately becomes uh, outside of the estate um, and not liable to inheritance tax. So still using 3,600 um, a year all the way until death is a very common, common strategy we use for clients. So some simple solutions. We've touched on a few of these um, earlier uh, in this presentation, but charitable giving is, is one that's sort of sometimes overlooked. So just an update on that, that if you do give over 10% of your uh, estate uh, to a charity, um, your inheritance tax rate on anything else drops from 40% to 36%. So that is a consideration if you're giving a decent amount to charity. Perhaps it's actually worth giving 10% to, to qualify for that. Um, spousal transfers shouldn't be over, over, overused. There is a reminder that married couples, it can be solved on second death. We like, to, again, to stress planning should be early as, early as possible, but um, spousal transfers are, are still viable. Gifting allowances, so this is one of our earliest uh, strategies and we use, use something called Family Gift Trust on Wrap Annual Allowance. So we have a specific investment vehicle to collect the 3,000 you're allowed to gift away uh, per person each year. Um, and we have lots of clients that that's a really, really favorable tactic because they're not ready to give away hundreds of thousands, but actually 3,000 into a protective environment where essentially sometimes we're taking it out of an ISA, putting it in a, in a family gift trust uh, annual allowance um, and investing it in exactly the same portfolio, which is transitioning it from one vehicle to another. And that fully avoids the seven year cycle as well. Uh, regular gifts, you can give as many gifts uh, up to 250,000. One thing I stress in all these things, documentation, crucial, crucial, crucial um, part of planning. Um, and again, probably the final one on the list over here uh, is marital gifts. So you're allowed to uh, give married couples a certain amount, again, avoiding that seven year cycle um, on their marriage day. So yeah, just a quick introduction to some of the smaller allowances that shouldn't be overlooked, uh, but perhaps aren't gonna solve the whole inheritance tax problem for you uh, as a client. So again, today's session isn't about going into uh, solutions in a lot of detail, and please you know, come into the office or contact one of the team for, for the options you have in a more bespoke uh, inheritance tax session with us. But looking at the rest of the solutions out there, we have the unique approach um, that we have both in-house wealth managers as well as in-house uh, estate practitioners. And thus, we think we can give both the IFA world as well as the private client world um, view and, and construction of an inheritance tax um, approach. Um, just using one, in my opinion, do doesn't give you the maximum options uh, available. So a unique part of our service is the ability to combine both. So just quickly running over some of the options available to you. Many people ensure their inheritance tax liability uh, through a whole of life policy. So what this means is a life assurance policy is taken out. It's called a whole of life policy because as long as you pay the premium for the rest of your life, there'll be a guaranteed payout tax free into a trust that we will have set up for beneficiaries to then settle the inheritance tax liability. Some people do that and say, you know what, I've covered the IHT liability. I've done, my, I've done my part. So that is a, 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 a available and common, commonly used um, approach. Potential exempt transfers, we've already touched on. That's the gifting of small or very large amounts directly to beneficiaries. Our view is use the CLTs first, consider potentially exempt transfers after. Put that extra bit of effort and precision into your planning. Uh, chargeable lifetime transfers, um, again, we talked uh, about these earlier. Um, in practice, we would advise you on size um, uh, of how much to put in, and these are put into something called a family gift trust. So these could be provider-based, where perhaps you put 100,000 into a trust with a provider. We would invest that money on arrival, 
uh, and that would be the, the inheritance tax planning and vehicle and with that seven year survival would be completely outside of the estate. Our Ascot Estate Planning Trust just give that extra bit of flexibility. That same 100,000 could go into a trust that we've created through Ascot Estate Planning and it wouldn't necessarily be forced to have to just go into a fund based um, proposal that, that, that the other option would be um, that, that we just presented. Instead here it could sit in cash, it could be loaned out to a beneficiary, it could be used for structured products, it could be used to go and buy a house or even get a mortgage for the uh, trust. So that family gift trust um, has much more flexibility using an Ascot estate planning but if you're someone that just wants the funds invested the, tr the, the provider uh, trust approach to that is probably a more cheaper route. Business relief a uh, very underused area in our opinion. Um, we have produced our own business relief solution including, including the creation of a limited company that then becomes a loan vehicle and has very secure asset backed loans uh, as its trading activity. Uh, uniquely here we haven't talked about the word trust uh, and after just two years um, it becomes fully exempt from inheritance tax so you know we, we have suddenly built up probably 30 to 40 client family businesses making loans as a as a really sort of unique and, and, and underused inheritance tax strategy and then finally equity release so lots of people have their wealth tied up in that main residence that they bought 50 years ago in Ascot perhaps and you know the 50,000 house is now three million pounds they don't actually have many other liquid assets that they can gift away um, yet they face a huge liability and it is on that main residence where such a large of amount of inheritance tax um, is due so equity release into trust is again a strategy that we have devised where we actually advise clients to consider putting uh, a lifetime mortgage onto a property uh, late in life release up to 650,000, put that into a trust, um, have a ha, you know, retain ownership of the house, pay some mortgage on, on the debt, but that is the only way of releasing money from a main residence uh, into a protected trust-based environment. So that's a whirlwind tour of these strategies here. All have their own use, all can be used in different sizes. The chargeable lifetime transfers can be done on a regular basis, uh, a lump basis, uh, inside an allowance basis, so there's whole new, you know, nuances outside of this. Um, in addition, you've got the use of enterprise investment schemes, seed enterprise investment schemes, AIM portfolios, offshore trust planning. So again, today's session was just a dip into a few uh, in ideas and, and thus the session being called an introduction to inheritance tax. So what are some of the myths of inheritance tax planning? Um, you know, really miss, miss uh, number one is taper relief. Um, we don't really see a use of taper relief. And very interestingly, in, in the um, uh, tax, and simplif tax and Simplification Committee's recent report, it was one of the things they recommended removing. So um, it's only applicable for people making more than 325,000 potentially exempt transfers, which is saying our planning doesn't, doesn't form um, a big part of it. Um, I'm too young to start my inheritance tax planning. Again, definitely, um, definitely a my myth um, of inheritance tax planning. We, we think some planning can be done, as we've stressed, um, at any age. So yeah, in, in the myths, um, you know, have a good look through, through the list there, um, you know, and you, you decide whether you do really think those are myths or whether you're at the stage where you can start your planning. To end this presentation, we'll just quickly talk about uh, wills and trusts. So as I say, um, our bloodline planning, which is putting trusts attached to wills um, to receive your estate, um, if you were to die in the most protected uh, manner, does nothing at all for inheritance tax. But again, we think there's um, massive benefits for those assets that you don't get out of your estate um, during your lifetime to be much better protected through a will with trust-based structure. Uh, and again, book, in our meeting, book, a, book a meeting with our in-house estate planning team. You can resolve both your bloodline planning um, as well as probably a longer term approach through inheritance tax to your lifetime planning. Um, but you, we would seriously um, ask clients and we you know, educate clients on a daily, weekly basis around the benefits of a well-structured well -structured will um, with trusts uh, attached to it. So thank you very much for your attention. Hopefully this session has been useful as an introduction to inheritance tax. Um, and as I outlined at the start of this presentation, um, please do tune in to many of our other videos that you can see um, available here in our YouTube um, architecture. 
And um, as I say, please get in touch uh, if you would like a more personalised, bespoke approach to any of these topics. Thanks for your attention.